We are excited to bring you this episode brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming. Their products are precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate in men's hygiene bundles. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer, 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code MOPODCAST20. That's M-O-W PODCAST20. Visit manscaped.com, chuck the code in and enjoy. Hey everyone, today on the pod we bring you an AFL legend. Hawthorne captain, premiership player, Coleman medal winner and now working on the coaching team at our beloved Saints, Jared Ruffhead. Ruffy, what a champion. Alongside his stellar career at the Hawks, I'm sure AFL fans will remember Ruffy's very public battle with cancer. He was generous and brave enough to dig into a few of those details during this chat. Here he talks about a part of life during the experimental treatment that he took. A couple of days before, you're walking Waverley in shorts and a singlet in the rain and people are like, what are you doing? And that was that was my only way to feel alive is having the cold wind in your face. Yeah. That was like, and people are like, you're a dickhead. But <laughs> yeah. it was like, that was the only way I could feel like I felt alive. He talks about the struggle and the difficulty of being the poster boy for melanoma, as he says, but then also about the positives that came out of it too. I mean, the the percentages of people that got skin checks post my diagnosis was like, right, if something good comes of this, it's going to be that other people are going to be found earlier than maybe what I was and don't have to go through something like this. So I guess, yeah, you feel like you've been able to help people in in a way, but at the same time, it's not something you wish you had to go through. He's an inspiring man to say the least, is young Jared Ruffett, and we're so grateful that he joined us for a chat. Please enjoy our conversation with AFL legend and clothesline thief, Jared Ruffett. You'll get it in a sec. Also, big shout out to the man, Mr. Mark Felix Four, for guessing right for our shout out this week. Love you, Fro. We might start, we do this little bit of a weird thing at the start, and we try and do like a bit of an icebreaker slash role play scenario. I'm right. not going to throw a role play at you. They're getting better. I'll say this, Ruffy. They're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I, I'm going to, I don't know, you might have one as well, but I'm going to first throw it to you, Ruffy, and yeah. growing up in the country as you did, I'm sure there's a little bit of, bit of um, charisma building fun that you had and character Mischief. building fun. Mischief. Mischief. Maybe better. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> my question to you is, Growing up as a kid, what did you get in the most trouble for doing from your parents? Um, yeah, so good question. We, as a, we, we would have, we, there's a group of us that are still pretty close to this day. There's about four or five of us. And when you're growing up in the country and you can't, obviously you're not 18 at the time, so you can't be going to the pub or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd get your box of carton colds, which aren't, weren't your carton drafts or whatnot. They were the carton colds of twist tops that you'd have to, <laughs> and blow the froth off the top of the stubby. <laughs> I reckon they're about 30, 35 bucks and you'd get you'd get <laughs> oh, through a few of those and then we, we'd do this, um, I guess, thing called commandoing, what we called it, which was we'd basically line up a street and you'd jump every back fence in a row and whatever you could grab, that was what you kept at the end of the <laughs> row of four or five fences. So whether it be if someone's hung out there washing or um, you find a bird bath or something like that, you try and take it and jump over the next fence. So for a couple of streets, well, for a while there, we thought we, we weren't getting caught, but when the cops realised it had start start in one place and finish in one place. I knew it was close to where <laughs> we would spend the night most Saturday night. So that was how we got. We didn't get caught, but I think we thought we got away with a lot more than what we what people actually knew. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, if you grow up in Lee and Gatha, like there's probably not as many back fences. <laughs> there's, 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 there's enough parts of town where you could you could do some damage, but yeah. Um, great. Nice. As I said, when we start, it was always home base was um, one of my best mates houses. And as I said, when it started there and normally finished around that area, the cops pretty much worked out what we were doing pretty quick, I think. Big reports in a big circle. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what it was. Exactly what it was. What was the what was the biggest claim? What did you what was your Well I, uh, he he, <laughs> he lit one of the paddocks on fire around the area. So that he got in a bit of trouble for that one. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> That's having a fair crack. That's a decent. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, Wowza. city life, city growing up in in the city is probably. I've got nothing on that. I think the most trouble I got in was my sister was hiding in the cubby house and she wouldn't let me in. So I 
grabbed a handful of rocks in a golf club and started teeing off into the windows. <laughs> smashing I think every the- kid, if, if, if you had golf clubs, every, every kid would have teed a golf ball up in their backyard and just tried to hit it left or right until you either heard a tin roof or a window go smash. <laughs> and then it was like, so I run inside and just hide for the next hour. I think <laughs> I got away with it. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. good. What about Jeez, you, Matt? What I mean, you- mine's like... I, I remember getting in so much trouble when I was young for my folks. This was like when computers just started coming into schools. Yeah. And me and my mate thought we were like master yeah. hackers because we worked out my teacher's password and got into like the her computer. Obviously, they like we were in the school library where the one computer was. And then the one other computer in the office was like, oh, there's a teacher logged on in the library, but she's sitting over there. Like I'm rushing in computer crimes because they like no one knew what a fuck it was yet (laughs) and my old man was like he worked as a computer programmer so he was like big trouble mum fuming all the rest of it and then like had a family do or whatever a week later or something and all of dad's mates from work were there and they were like computer programmers so they're like oh michael we heard you hacked into your teacher's computer that's awesome yeah good what'd you get into (laughs) he does the worst yeah, Real positive reinforcement, you know. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry about watching footy on the Saturday night. Just talk to the computer hackers and work out what you're gonna. Do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No shit. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's it. No, no back fences jump though. I'll say that. <laughs> my, 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 just add in. We don't. What is it? Commandoing. Don't condone commandoing. <laughs> no, 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 that was again. This is nearly twenty years ago now. So you thought that you were um, invincible back yeah, then. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's fair to say we've we've definitely grown up and matured, which is a good thing. Now you just knock on the front door and ask if you can go through. And... <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not no. Quite. No. no, that's very good. Thanks, mate. It's a good 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 way to start and get a bit of an insight into, <laughs> into the background. It's, it's yeah. good. Why don't we go? Let's go. I guess back into that mm. that age bracket, maybe, and growing up big in your basketball and and your footy, and you know yeah. I think big big country basketballer. For a long time and, and obviously with football as well but I'm, I'm always interested to know where the decision to go one way or the other came from yeah um, and and being you know quite successful and reaching that that level in both sports what what was the um idea? like i guess i guess country kid you know 15 20 years ago there was no play or there were playstations and nintendo 64s were basically the first two things that i mm. can remember video games wise but i was never I was never into them and always outside. So I'm the eldest of three. Um, and back home, you'd basically play every sport you could have, you know, footy, basketball, cricket, um, night tennis, tennis, mixed netball, um, every, anything that was pretty much available, you, you were doing. So um, first, I suppose, yeah, sporting love was basketball. Um, played a fair bit. And then due to, I suppose, commitments with um, school and footy, Mel, you know, driving to Melbourne three nights a week, um, Wednesday nights to train, Sunday mornings to train, and then Friday nights could be anywhere from. Oh, I played for Dandenong, so um, Dandenong was home, stud road there, um, and you could drive anywhere to Geelong, um, Ballarat, some Friday nights. So you're leaving school at basically four, getting there for an 8:40 game, play that home by nine or ten, or probably later, eleven or twelve, and then you and then you're off to say sail or math for the next morning for footy. Yeah. Um, and had to be there at nine o'clock. I remember basically year 11 and 12, I had something on every night, whether it be mm. footy training or basketball. So mm. the love, I suppose, of that, you just fell out of love really because of um, the travel commitments, missing out on, you know, friends, or just basically missing out on childhood really. Mm. Um, and, and you know, we weren't, we weren't well off as a, as a family. So, you know, I remember the 2002 Basketball Nationals, um, we basically had to fundraise to get all the Vic Country kids over there. Um, mm. We caught a bus from basically Albert Park and we knew the Vic Metro team were flying. Um, the next year, the next year, we, I was lucky enough to make under 16 footy nationals and AFL takes care of everything. Mm. You've got a flight over to Adelaide, you've got, you know, all this care, you get all the, all the gear looked after. Mm. And I suppose then, you know, the opportunity to potentially make all Australians and stuff like that was a bigger carrot than what basketball was. Um, you know, the NBL is a great league now, but at the time it probably wasn't at, at its best. And obviously to make um, some really, really good money or be really, really successful in basketball, you're either going to have to go to Europe or 
America. So yeah. chances that was slim from a boy from back home. So I remember my old man who had played a lot of footy um, for Lane Gaffer. He just said, look, if you, if you finish up, I'll coach you under 16 footy side. So that was enough for me to say, yep, I'll give, give basketball away. Still played domestically and, and, you know, we're still even now, like we play Wednesday nights, which is, um, which is good. But dad said, yep, if you finish up, I'll coach your footy side. And I only played four games for him that year because I was lucky enough to play seniors at Lee and Gatha. So um, we lost the grand final in, at the end of 03. But that was that was probably the main reason why I flipped from basketball yeah. to footy. Was growing up, were you like really close with your dad, with your old man? Were you guys good mates? Or was it more um, because he played footy and, you know, it was quite quite decent down in the, in the local town that you I, wanted to... I, I think... Yeah, like, I'd, I'd, I mean, you'd go to watch dad um, a fair bit, but I think also, too, just with understanding what they'd probably given up as parents. Like, I was yeah. the eldest, as I said, so you've got, you've got a brother and sister who are getting dragged around the country to watch me play. Um, you know, it was like, right, I've probably got a... I'm not, that I, not that I'd, like, say... Um, yeah, that, that they... Or I didn't have to sacrifice too much because you were getting driven around the country. But I suppose now... and you know, 20 years on, my dad's been diagnosed with MS for the last 20 years. So um, seeing that's been, you know, tough and there's been family issues because of all that. But um, yeah, I'd say that having your old man coach is a pretty big thing as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think I like in the in the same sort of sentiment with, with having the old man as a coach, I, I grew up playing basketball and, as well. And probably, I mean, I'm gathering you were probably playing like VC, like fifth championship level. Yeah. I was uh, I was like Metro Two, Metro Three Sabres basketball. So oh yeah, Sandy I Sabres representing. I, I, yeah. I was traveling far to like Frankston and yeah, you know, like from Sandyham to Frankston. Or I think the furthest I went was like Melton or Sunshine or something, mm, okay, yeah. which was still a hike. But mm. compare that to Lane Gather to Danny on and then yeah. to whatever. Yeah, you know, my my I still hear my old man talking about how much he hated Friday nights because he <laughs> my sister was playing rep as well. So yeah. mum was going one way, dad was going the other way and they yeah. wouldn't see each other till Monday morning. Yeah. You know, training Saturday, you know, domestic basketball Saturday, training again Sunday, mum and dad wouldn't catch up till Monday morning and some weekends. So I was I was very similar. And then I, I had the opportunity for Shane to coach me mm-hmm. in like maybe under twelves or fourteens basketball for a season. And then it turned to shit with a few things, but yeah, uh, like, you know, a few, I think it was, it was pretty hectic at the time. Like a few of the other families weren't, weren't stoked with it, but I loved being able to have my old man coach me. Yeah. We still talk about joining a team. Like he can't run anymore. He's not allowed to run, but <laughs> he's got a main corner three on him. So <laughs> he'd be pretty happy to, to run around on yeah, the corner exactly. for sure. But yeah, I think that's really important. And like you said, like being at the age now to you sort of get more of an understanding of what they were doing and yeah and how hard they were they were looking at or how much they were looking after us in getting us to the games even just or like even to training mm. i suppose it's pretty cool yeah pretty cool the man they had to sacrifice and, and and now having kids yourself it's like right if they're any good or you want to give them the best chance and they're it's like right if we have to do it you have to do it mm. Mm. for sure yeah well i guess that's it isn't it if they're sort of like end up down that path Mm. Like you're, gonna, you're gonna you know pay it forward the same way you were uh yeah you were paid it for by the folks no that's awesome right. how are the are your kids tall are they you know do they look like basketball <laughs> <or? laughs> pips four so she we, yesterday funnily enough we had ballet uh, in the morning and karate in the afternoon um and <laughs> then will yeah balances it right out uh will he's only 18 months so we're just starting to get a bit of a personality with him and a fair few words. So they're, I mean, they're both outdoor kids, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, can't get Will to watch Bluey. That's what your life comes to at about six o'clock at night. You watch a couple of episodes of Bluey before bed, read a few books and then you're done. So um, <laughs> it's completely changed to what it once was. That's for sure. Hey, to be fair, Bluey's not actually that bad. No. I've, I've seen nearly every yeah. episode with school. Oh, and yeah, 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 I'm, yeah I don't mind it to be honest. Yeah. There is there is times where you get caught by the wife and she, you're just gazing into the TV and the, both kids are outside on the monkey bars. And it's yeah. like, what's going on? It's like, yeah, well. Yeah, episode, hang on. <laughs> oh, no, that's brilliant. really good. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, no, well, thanks for sharing. And, and mm. also thank you, I guess, for, for talking about your, your dad and 
you know, the position that he's in at the moment as well. And and obviously all we, we would probably easily say wish him all the best and, and your family all the best in yeah. in everything around that. It's it's obviously not an easy thing to see, like you said, your old man go from wheeling and dealing and driving you around the country to to fighting his own fight now. So thank you for sharing that, mate. It's very grateful. Mm. Probably gonna brush it off because you I can tell you're pretty humble already. So <laughs> It's fair to say you, you do have one of the most le- legendary careers easily in, in terms of the modern era footballer, you know, four-time premiership player, Coleman medalist, um, you know, the story, the list goes on. It's, it's pretty impeccable stuff. So I guess we'd love to, you know, what a, I didn't even say it, nearly 600 goals as well, which is humongous in this, mm. in this day and age. And um, I'd love to know, obviously you were, you're part of one of the most successful teams in history mm-hmm. um love to know one what it was like being a part of that in in the highs and also the the lows i know when you got drafted you know the success didn't come yeah overnight it wasn't like you were just drafted into a champion team mm-hmm. yeah um it's well documented as well so yeah love to know the journey of the, the roller coaster yeah so i guess initially um you know you've been drafted from home Within the space of two weeks, I'd had to be—I had to get a passport and get immunisations to go to Kokoda, which was something that I was not—I probably was dreading a little bit because it's like, yeah. right, I what, what, like if I get drafted to an AFL club and I go that within the first two weeks, it's like, what's going on? Especially <laughs> the night before the draft, I was given a call by Richmond to say we're going to take you tomorrow at pick four. So we had our school graduation. I was telling all my friends, um, family that I'm going to Richmond tomorrow, yeah. um, and we had a bit of a do that next night. So. Within 24 hours, that changed completely. Mm. Um, and, and you know, probably early days, and I'd be first to admit, and a lot of the teammates would remind me too, that we probably didn't earn our games as, as much as what you probably would now as young kids. Hawthorne were in a position that they needed to blood a lot of young kids. So um, my first couple of years, you're in and out of the side. Um, and it probably took, I don't know, midway through 2007, I'd, I'd been dropped a couple of times and... Um, mm. I remember playing a game on Saturday at, at Box Hill against Williamstown. And then the, that next morning, I had to fly to Adelaide to play Port Adelaide in, in the afternoon. So a couple of injuries happened and I just, they said, right, I try and just do as many ice bars and whatnot as you can. We'll give you a massage when you get here. But they'd already mm-hmm. taken two travellers and, and got um, a third mm-hmm. injury. So I reckon I went across. I only had about three touches, but from then on, I never went out of the side again unless um, basically until the end of my career when I got dropped at the end of 2019, uh, sorry. Mm. So it probably took a few years to establish myself as a, as an AFL player. And that was similar to the side because midway through seven, we started to get on a run. And um, I remember we made the finals and we won our first final, which was the, the game Bud kicked that goal against Adelaide. I think he kicked seven for the day. Mm. And from, and then next year we just went on a run. We, we started off really, really well. Um, and we probably reached the, you know, the summit of the mountain a lot earlier than what a lot of us would have thought of, you know, to win a flag at 21, yeah. um, Bud kicks 113, I kick 75. Um, yeah. You're playing with Cyril plays every game, um, Jordy Lewis is, and then you've got, you know, these older boys like Mitch and Hodgie and yeah. um, Chance Bateman, Dewey that have been there for so long, but also are so young. You know, we got, that was our fourth year. This was about their fifth or sixth. So, you know, we, we we probably, after that, we learned the hard way because we came back with an extra person in body fat in 2009. <laughs> um, we missed the finals, first team to miss the finals after winning a flag that yeah. next year. 2010, we, we try and change a few things. Clarko nearly gets sacked. Um, 11, I, admit, I snap an Achilles and don't play the, basically the second half of the year. 2012, we lose a granny. Mm-hmm. Um so between eight and 13, everyone just thinks we go on this, you know, amazing run where we win four flags and everything just takes care of itself. But we had to go through a fair bit of adversity and I suppose work each other out and challenge each other because, you know, we there we had some um, quality players. It was like, right, oh, how are we going to best gel and, and challenge each other without trying to get our backs up? Or, you know, if you, if, if you played against us, 13, 14, 15, you'd think some of us hated each other the way we spoke to each other on field, but that was just what we had to do to get um, the job done. And we understood that, you know, leaders put up their hand at the end of 2012 after we lost the grand final and said, it's pretty much on us. We, we, we're a leadership group that was more like 
do as we say, not as we do. So um, we took some responsibility and, and, you know, from then on 13, 14, 15, it was like, right, we're, we've got something special. We added some some pieces, but I mean, Clarko was very, very good at, at keeping us motivated and making us feel like we were, I suppose, always the hunters rather than the hunted, for, you know. And then, and, and it also too, like you say, what was it like? I guess you don't really appreciate it until you finish up and you get to talk um, during these these type of um, catch-ups, but also, you know, when you see each other because you look at Hawthorne now and what they've been through probably the last two years especially, it's like, wow, that only, you know, we've got our first 10-year reunion of the three-peat only next year. So, yeah, you wow. know, seven, seven years ago, we won 15 and 16, we got we went out in straight sets. But, yeah. you know, we, that's only five or six years ago. Yeah. How quick can all change? Very, isn't it drastic? Huge yeah, turnaround. Do you, is there, you know, in just saying that, and you, you were sort of mentioning, uh, you know, like keeping, I guess, on top of each other and, and holding each other accountable and that. Do you think there was ever any, like, complacency that crept in with that? Like, do you think people were like, you know, you, you mentioned 08 win, 09 miss completely. Was it more, do you think in that in that year, maybe 2009, there were, Blokes walking around being like, oh, we got this. We're, you know, we're yeah. the best. We're not going to train hard. You know, was that what it, was that what stood out? Or oh, I definitely think you just thought it was going to happen, and, every, and you hear that too. Like it's like, righto, oh, we we get off to an all right start in 09. Um, we knew we had players coming back, and we were probably just reliant on all right. We've got an excuse of injuries or. Um, and also the coaches would admit we didn't adapt to and try and get better. We just tried to roll out the same game plan for mm-hmm. 2009 and basically the first seven weeks of 2010. And I reckon it came to the game against Richmond when Sam Mitchell tacky, tackled Shane Tuck going inside 50. And if it wasn't for that tackle, Clark, I was probably going to get sacked on the Monday. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there may not have ever been us again you know we, yeah. we may have blown the team up at the end of the year same thing happened at the end of 13 if we didn't beat Geelong in that prelim you know we're probably sitting here maybe one maybe lucky enough to get a second premiership but definitely not four mm. that's an interesting point as well the mm. whole sorry I, there you I jumped in there that like the experience of that whole battle between the the cats and the hawks for yeah. that whole time and you know how serious and how tense it was you know, mm. there's famous words was it maybe Paul Chapman at the Cats? He was like, we, when you guys pipped him and he was like, we will never lose to these mob yeah. again, essentially. And yeah. you could see like as a fan, like my, my partner Amy's a huge Geelong fan and she, we went, I went as a neutral St Kilda supporter to watch Geelong play Hawthorne like five or six times because it was just incredible. You knew that yeah. there was going to be fireworks. You knew it was going to be an incredible football match. What was it like? Yeah. Or, or maybe what is what was it like for any game? But rocking up to the G with a hundred thousand people, and you know you're going head to head against the team that the two of you have the best match up in in the yeah. league. Yeah. Again, looking back on it, it's like it, when when you get asked at, at events or what, who you know who are the teams you you love to play, play against and who do you hate, and everyone thinks, oh, you'll hate Geelong and you'll hate this, but it's like they're the ones that you you remember the most, like Geelong, Sydney, West Coast. The teams that were so successful through that period are the teams you you respect the most and you like had the best battles with because I reckon, that, and I've said this a couple of times, out of that 2013 prelim that we beat Geelong and come back to win, I'm just, I reckon there's going to be 14 AFL Hall of Famers and maybe five or six legends when you think about both sides. So you've yeah. got you know, yeah. Burgoyne, Hodge, Mitchell, Rioli, Clarkson as coach, and then you've got Scarlett, Enright, Taylor, Hawkins, Selwood. There's, there's like just off the bat, there's ten. Yeah. That you're gonna go like good luck trying to argue that none of them will get in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, Chris Scott will probably be another one. Um, so those games, it's like, well, good luck ever trying to get that many on the field at one time again. Yeah. Ever, yeah. So it's like when you think of it like that, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So. When, when you think about those games, yeah, like they're the ones you remember the most because you get to play against the best, um, the, a great rivalry. And now you look at it and it's like, when you see the game on Easter Monday, it's like, oh, I was once a part of that and not created it, but we, we were part of basically those two sides that, that mm. 
kept the dream going from these two te- these two team supporters from basically 1989. Mm, 100%. In that, are you like, so I guess I'm sort of jumping forward in the timeline a little bit here, but when you, like, was there a point that you remember like arriving at that conclusion that you were like, I guess after you've sort of finished up your playing career, was there a point that you kind of like, did you make like a concerted effort to go back and be like, oh, I actually want to like reflect on a career. And I'm always interested, I guess, for players, like as they're finishing up their mm-hmm. careers, like if it's something, you know, I guess being a career that you retire at a lot earlier than what, you know, the average punter will retire at, yeah. you know, like what's, what is that sort of in the immediate aftermath of, yeah, of, a, of like a retirement, what's that sort of like? And did you, yeah, like when did that sort of reflection, I guess, start or do you notice it sort of starting? Um, I guess for me, and this is a, a weird one, but are you get for a way that I've been able to reflect and enjoy what was 15 years at one club is Hawks had so many different jumpers. So we had, you know, white ones, um, clash ones, the, the traditional brown and yellow stripes. We had the re- brown V. So what I don't, I have five jumpers, I think left, which are all the, the four flag ones and a long sleeve that, cause no one ever thinks that Hawthorne got long sleeves, but after, <laughs> um, after going through my illness, it was like, right, I added us made a few long sleeves for sun and stuff like that. So I'm one of the ones that have got a rare Hawthorne long sleeve that, yeah, you know, nice. yeah. that Will might wear, get to wear the footy chain in one night. But what I've done with all the others is I've traded them with other blokes I've played with or other sportsmen. So I've got um, a Pendlebury, a Harry Taylor, um, Stewie Dewport Adelaide, Josh Kennedy Eagles, and basically every Hawks player that like... Mitch Hodgie, Geordie, Cyril, all these guys, I've got one of their jumpers. So, you know, something like that where you can pull them out um, and say to your kids or say to friends or even if you've got a mate who's a Geelong supporter, it's like, oh, well, I've got a Harry Taylor number seven. I don't, like, it's so good to me because I remember what he was the hardest player. But if it's going to put a smile on his face, I'd rather give it to him. So, um, you know, lucky enough that throughout footy, you were able to meet so many good people. I remember I've got, I've got a Johnny Hastings, one day shirt i've got um a heap of basketball ones as well but um yeah it's just like that's the stuff that you get to reflect on because it's like um 15 years but how many different relationships you make with guys from other teams and stuff like that i found that pretty cool oh, yeah that's, that's such cool. a cool like vehicle for that reflection i guess yeah like, to be able to have those and i guess that's i mean and that's where that I mean, I was always kind of baffled by the world of like sporting memorabilia, you know what I mean? But yeah. it is, it's only like now being a little bit older and a little bit wiser that I come to understand like that, like that is even like for punters and for fans and stuff, like that's what, it's so meaningful to people if for mm-hmm. so many different reasons. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, and yeah, like that's a perfect one for you, obviously, because it's literally so close to home. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and all like... I mean, I'm not one that, if, like, if you came through the house, I don't have them hanging up. They're up in storage yeah. because I've got two kids now. But I'm in a room upstairs and I've got, what have I got? I've got one photo, <laughs> which is, this is Pippa with the, like, that's the one of the main yeah. photos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did all that. And that's probably the best photo that I've got of, like, your footy career. Yeah. Because that sums it up all in one, really. You're wearing the colours that you wore for 15 years. You've got your daughter and that's the four that's all you play footy for. So something like that's pretty cool um, and really defines what I suppose 15 years means. Mm. Oh, I, yeah. I like the the trade as well. Like it's not something that is quite, I don't know, maybe for players and behind the scenes doing the, doing yeah. the jersey swaps behind the scenes is maybe more frequent than, than you'd think. But, you know, mm. like when you watch soccer, the world game, they, yeah. And when the two best of the best go head to head at the end of the game, they're always ripping it off and swapping. Yeah. It's not something you see that often in the AFL. And I know like even mm. in the last couple of years when it happens, the media makes such a big deal of it at the time. Like the commentators are like, Oh, he's got his top up. Oh, who's he going to go up to sort of thing. So yeah. it is, I think it's a really significant thing as a, for the players to be able to do. And I think I'd, I'd love to see it more. Because it shows that relationship yeah. that, you, that you're sort of talking about and, that, yeah. and the bonds, you know, like you guys are the only ones that know how hard it is to play AFL at the top yeah. level. You know, like it's that respect. I, mm. I reckon it's sick. Mm. 100%. You mentioned in that in that little, I guess, reflective period then about um, doing your Achilles and, and that was sort of, I guess, maybe the, the first major injury that you had um, in your playing career. And 
you know, every every single footballer we've spoken to on on this show has has mentioned an, a significant injury and yeah. and a toll it took on them personally, let alone you know, obviously professionally. That clearly you're missing games of footy, which is what you're paid to to do. So um, they they all spoke about the toll of of that on their personal life and and how hard it was to you know all of a sudden you're on the out in the rehab group and you know you're not joining in the main training sessions for weeks on end and. You know, Achilles is not something that's fixed straight away. It's a it's a long, lingering injury at the best of times. Like, I'd lo- I'd love to know. Um, was that like twenty eleven ish? You said, yep. yeah. Yep. So you know, that's six, five, six years, seven years into your into your career. Um, it's a pretty decent run without it without a significant injury. And what what was it like to have that that one big um, key injury? You know, it took that um, long to get there. How how did that impact you? Uh, to be honest, the only time it impacted me was in the prelim final when you're standing there at the back of the box and it's like, we, and that was a game against Collingwood where Bud kicks a goal and then Dane Swan kicks one at the other, or Bawley mm-hmm. kicks one at the other end. That was the only time where I was flat because it's like, right, if they win, they're in a grand final and I'm not playing. But if they lose, um, I'm still going to be flat that we didn't make a grand final. Yeah. But in terms of like uh, with... My Achilles, I, I, it got infected after eight weeks. So I had to basically go back to the start and rehab again. Jeez. And so I, I get I get the, the, the way that people feel um, isolated and and um, I suppose just caught out with thinking that, you know, that, that poor me. But when you get told that you've got like six or eight months out, it's like, right, how can you attack it to beat? what they say so target, yeah. as soon as soon as they gave you a timeline it was like right well i can't do anything about the injury i can't do anything about surgery but now that i've had it it's like right let's just attack it and go for it so um you know the second that like the achilles was fine because you're 24 years old you know that you're going to come back um it was it was a rare injury um and still really is but yeah. the, i had a, I had a um, pcl rico at the end of oh, sorry at the start of 16 so i got married january 16 10 days later, I'm in for surgery, um, being told I was going to miss half the year. Um, so that, that one was probably, that's probably worse because it's like you miss for the um, 10 or 11 years that I played beforehand. I hadn't missed really mm. uh, uh, that many, that amount of time. So that one I found more trouble with. And then obviously when I got um, sick uh, midway through that year, that the knee got taken um, was second. But mm. I suppose that when... You know, you, you do a, a heap of work in pre-season and then all of a sudden it's like, right, you're just going to have to stop. Here's a, a different Rico that we don't normally suggest. Um, it's similar to an ACL where they take a hamstring tendon, drill a couple of holes and then you can't bend your knee for five or six weeks. We were living, we are about to start a reno. Um, we couldn't get any rentals on a place because we've got a dog and a cat so that no no one was going to take a six-month rental on <laughs> on us. So basically from the end of uh, end of 15 where it was unreal winning the, the, another flag and then basically from um, the start of 16 onwards for the next, you know, what's that, 12 months, it was a complete 180 to what you're really used to. Yeah. The big, like, rise and fall of that, I guess, um, is, yeah, it's, you know, it's going to affect anybody really. Like, in you know, I don't think anyone's immune to that sort of, like, roller coaster emotions and all that sort of stuff yeah with with you and in the period that you're active within the club and within a, the afl i guess more broadly i guess in in chatting to a lot of players that are like they're like current players and that are you know and they're quite young and maybe even just quite early on in their careers there's obviously has been this there's now this such a huge focus on like mindset and mindfulness um and and mental health like more broadly like within within football clubs and I'm curious, I guess, like for you, just kind of being, I guess, that like half or maybe a quarter of a generation sort of yeah. before, like, I guess that stuff has become really, really prevalent. Yeah. I'm interested, like in the time while you're, while you're there and, and even with these big ups and downs and stuff, what does the support network in, as a, in regards to like mental health and that side of stuff sort of yeah. look like at that time? Um, so basically, I would say that it was like maybe the last two years at Hawthorne is when we had a, a part-time psych. So it wasn't even um, full time to what you know most clubs have now, and even since transitioning out of playing and going into administration and seeing what St Kilda do, mm. you know we've got Ben Robbins who's um, ex uh, North Melbourne and Brisbane, and and he's unreal. So for for that period of time before that, it was basically chatting to the head of fitness, head of head physio or coach, 
or line coach. So that, that was basically your, your four touch points within a club that you could be open and honest with and, and tell people how you're feeling and whatnot. And also to the boys, like we had a pretty um, you know, well-connected group that, you know, a lot of us have been in each other's wedding parties and still going to each other's weddings and stuff like that. So we were pretty open in that sense. And maybe, you know, some of us weren't, but I think for that period of time, we, we didn't really, like we had a lot of adversity that you wouldn't have really mm. noticed through the, the four or five years with, um, you know, Mitch, Mitch did a homie, Clarko got sick, Gibbo did, ripped his peck, Bud was going through what he was going through. Um, so there was a lot of us that had, whether or not long periods or short periods, we all had something going on. But at the end of the day, when we got to the club, that, and I've said it before, that it feels like your second home. That was your safe place rather than being at home. So we were very, very lucky that, you know, when you drive out to Waverley, um, there's not much else really out there. There's no, you know, there's no public transport. There's no cafes and whatnot for you to go to. Um, you're basically with each other for long periods of time of the day, which was a good thing. And I guess that's kind of like being able to have that experience with all the other guys has really kind of set you up for like, you know, the more administrative sort of role and had to have a better understanding of how it is now with all of this mental health support and all of this focus being put on that sort of stuff. Cause you've obviously, you know, by the sounds of things, obviously have a great appreciation for like what St. Kilda is doing, say, for example. Yeah. And, oh yeah. yeah. And that, that's, that, I mean, that's the stuff that you kind of wish you had maybe mm -hmm. as a player or, or mm -hmm. you know, you, when you think of different teammates that maybe didn't make it or maybe didn't reach their full potential, it's like, well, if we had these resources, what could have been or what else could we have done or, mm -hmm. Uh, will we, will we, would we have been able to help people earlier than when they, you know, went into their times of need? So, uh, you, you know, it's I reckon it's great for footy clubs now and it's been awesome for St Kilda. We have a sleep room. We have, um, you know, they've just recently opened the Danny Frawley Centre, which is yeah. from, which is just, we had a tour last Friday, which was unreal. Um, and it's going to be a place that, you know, public can use, but also the past players of St Kilda, current day players. It's something that's pretty big and only going to get bigger in, in all sport really yeah we've been following sort of like the yeah the Danny Frawley Centre pretty closely because we were you know super like really fortunate to chat to Wayne Swass in 2020 and have um you know even like a, a you know someone else we interviewed and a little I guess Murph's idol in the uh, teaching world is uh speaking at the Danny Frawley Centre tomorrow night Martin Hammer. Right. So, yeah we're um yeah we're keen to stick our beaks in there and have a bit of a yeah. look around yeah. and we're super keen it sounds awesome yeah I, yeah, I think you can sort of see from, I mean, since we've started doing this, you can see the, the difference in resources for yeah, past players and, and present players. And I think it's, yeah, so important. What I, what I loved about that, though, was you sort of, one thing you mentioned, I think it stood out to me, one being we're both, you know, relatively recently engaged to our partners. So we're, we're in, right in the headset of, of weddings at the moment. And mm -hmm. you mentioned just in in them that you you know you said a lot of the boys were part of the you know the part of the wedding day bridal parties and you know still attending each other's weddings and that as well which is you know it's obviously i found it to be oh, i suppose i was pretty lucky i knew pretty easily who i was going to pick on the day but mm. it's one of the most important decisions of of the wedding day is, is you know who you want to have up there standing next to you and to be able to say that you know you you guys are still in touch and you know we're all part of the day for one here there everywhere it's it shows how tight knit you guys were and how supportive you were and um i think you've even you know you mentioned it um in a recent podcast you did that when when you were sick a bit later on the first one of the first people you you spoke to was i think you called jordan lewis and said just like maybe yeah. maybe me back at the club which you, yeah. you, know, you said just then was your second home so it just shows that I guess the nurture within the place to to be able to go there and and you know have you know that your mates have got their your back and mm. yeah it's a pretty special pretty special time. Just the usual, please, good sir. Thank you. Oof. Well, it's good to see you, my friend. Good to be back, Murph. Ready for a clean up. Oh, luckily. And I'm very excited to be talking about the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 coming to our Men of Words community. What they, is it? They've just jumped on board as the sponsors. We're very stoked to have them on board. And we've got one here that we're doing a bit of a run through. 
They've got everything for your male grooming needs that you could possibly have. Got our weed whacker for your ear and nose here. Got to get around that stuff. Now that we're, we're 30 mer, yeah. you know, not young men anymore. So got to be thinking about this happening. stuff. <laughs> I've noticed that happening. What have we got? We've got plenty of goodies in here. You're giving me the run over with the uh, Lawnmower 4.0. Multi-purpose groomer, obviously a uh, handy blow at the belt, but we're repurposing it for the noggin today, which we love. We've got our Manscaped Crop Preserver and we've got our Ball Toner as well. Just keep things nice and tidy and fresh down there, as you love. Got a beautiful set of chafe-free undies Ooh. to go along after a fresh shave, just in case you need it. Accessories for days that we can see through here. You've got yourself a lovely leather bag that it all goes in as well. And we're stoked to have them on board. Murph, we've also got a little bit of a discount code for our Men of Words community, don't we? That we do. Yes. You guys can jump online at manscaped.com and use the code MOPODCAST20, M-O-W-PODCAST20, for 20% off and yeah. free shipping. How good is that? And do you know what, Muff? I'm loving this because I could probably do this at night time. There is a little light a little just here, light. which makes me get so much more visibility down behind here in the shade. I'll tell you what. And it'll be very handy down below, mate. The Manscaped crew have thought of everything. Jump yeah. on, use our discount code, love it. Thanks for the support, Manscaped. Get around them. Perhaps maybe it's a good opportunity to, to lean into that side of the conversation, Jared, and yeah. um, if you're willing to, yeah. we. I know it's obviously being well documented in the media when you were playing that it was, you know, what the, the battles you were going through with, with um, the cancer. And, you know, I think you said it started as a, a nothing, you know, like you had a, a, a yep. blister on your lip that was given the all clear essentially. And then the coin flipped and you were called back and it was a, a melanoma. And then, you know, for a few, you can tell the story, but yeah. Yeah, love, love yeah, so, story, yeah. As you said, um, Start of 2015, um, you know, nothing out of the ordinary really for a kid with red hair and fair skin from the country. Um, I was pretty diligent with hats and sunscreens and zincs and stuff like this. And um, I had a uh, just a little blister that I thought was nothing really. Um, it went a bit dark, a couple a bit down the track. And then one thing one of the doctors said, is it bleeding if it's still bleeding when you're knocking in it? And sure enough, it was. Well, you better go get a punch biopsy. And this was, I reckon it's, it would have been there for two or three months. So, yeah, way too long. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I've gone and had the punch biopsy. I remember playing Essendon on the Sunday. We had a good win. And then the next month, on the Monday, um, I was actually driving Geordie out to uh, a car dealership out at Berwick, packing them, and got the call from the uh, skin doctor, dermatologist. And he said, um, Look, it's this one's melanoma. He said it was, you know, there's a different terminologies, the, the, the cysts and CBCs or whatever they are. Anyway, I was like, all right, cool. And I remember ringing our club doctor who I'd known since I was 16 before AFL. And I said, mate, what are we doing? He's like, all right, you better come back in. We're going to talk about this. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm. So and he's like, we're going to have to cut it out. And I was like, oh, you know, it's not, it's not that big. I was like, if they cut it out today, we were playing Collingwood on the Friday night, which was fun, which was the week that Phil Walsh passed away as well. So yeah, okay. I um he said, No, nah, I reckon you're gonna miss a little bit more than just or well, I don't think you'll be playing this week. And sure enough, so I've gone into this um plastic surgeon who's just around the corner in queue. He's a mate, he's definitely a friend now. Um <laughs> and he said, Right, oh, he's drawn, you know, he's drawn up what we have to do. He goes, I'm gonna cut a quarter of your bottom lip out. And I was like, All right. So it was three centimeters wide and then 10 centimeters down. So it was basically just a big V that was coming out. And I remember him looking at his computer before the surgery. I said, Oh, just double checking the scan and all that before I went to sleep. He's like, no, nah, I'm just doing my playlist for the surgery. And I was like, mate, you're not giving me any, you're not giving me any confidence here. I said, what, can, I, can I ask what you're listening to? Yeah, exactly. I've, got of, I've got some cold play and some, so I was like, all right, I'm, I'm content well, with that. Before, that yeah. Exactly. No, getting, as long as it wasn't like, yeah, <laughs> no shit. Before well, getting gas and going like, to sleep. So, um, and again, you know, talking before when I said you, how long are you going to be told you're out for? It's like, right, two weeks. You do all the specialist checkups. You get given the all clear. And, and, and again, I, I was probably a bit naive to understand how serious it was. So mm. I missed the Collingwood game, missed the Freo game, came back to play uh, the Swans up in Sydney, which was a game where I ripped my back on those bolts at ANZ Stadium. 
that's one. That's it. That's the one. That I, that's that's the only reason why I really remember coming back that game. So basically, the second the rest of that year was was good. We played, as I said, the flag in at the end of fifteen. Go away, play the Aussie International Rules Tour in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Come back, um, all have all the wedding prep, and then uh, surgery on the knee. And then it gets to May. And in, in between all this, you have what they call PET scans, which are scans that determine whether or not you've got um, tumours in your body. So they'll inject a glucose in your body. You sit and rest for an hour and whether or not, they, when they go through the machine, it'll say, you know, or it'll light up basically you've got. So the ones, so I went through two of those and they were all clear. So it was almost like, um, you know, you don't really need to keep coming back. And they said, oh, we'll just do, we won't just do it. It was every three months, I think, post- um my lip so mm-hmm. got to the may may one and i would have um my scan on one monday and then get my results the following monday so mm-hmm. at the time it's like yep yeah, no worries where but as you can imagine now when i get through all this it's like i don't need a week to sit and think i need to know within the next couple of hours so yeah, yeah. luckily enough peter mac are very good at organizing telehealth and whatnot and you can do that now but as i said you had a week in between so um I was gearing up. Geordie Lewis was going to play his 250th and I was trying to get back for that. Um, and I remember going in to see him for my results. This is my oncologist, Grant. And he said, um, rough, how are you? I said, yeah, mate, good. Got, you know, my knee's nearly there. We're going to be good. And this was at the old Peter Mac, which is in behind the MCG on Rath Down Street. And then I remember him just saying, oh, we're, we're in a bit of trouble. And I was like, oh, I've just got a freckle that's been angry or something like that. And he said, no, 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 you've got... And he pulled up the computer scan. He goes, you've got some tumours on your lungs. And I was like, oh, fuck. Mm. Like Initially, I just remember standing up. It was still reasonably warm. So I just put all my keys, phone, wallet on the on the desk. And I just started walking around the room asking questions. Mm. And luckily enough, I had, um, as I mentioned before, our doc, Michael McDesey, he would always come to these uh, mm. catch-ups with them and whatnot. So that next little hour, I was okay because you're probably in shock. So... Hmm. asking hmm. all these questions what's going to happen what are we going to do and then it's like right i'm missing he goes initially he goes 18 months footy and i was like wow, wow. that means i'm out to the end of 17 i'll be 30 it's almost like career and career done and that that's just purely athlete mindset i think yeah, of course, thinking yeah, yeah. that's what's going to happen so um again i'm not thinking shit i've got to go home and try and tell sarah this um and doc goes what do you want to do i said um, I'm just going to drive to the footy club. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. It was four o'clock on a Monday Arvo in Melbourne. So it's probably not great driving from Punt Road to, to Wellington Road. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I reckon I just drove in silence. And when I got to um, the on the freeway entry ramp, I rang Jordan to say, he goes, where are you? Because I knew the review was always four o'clock on a Monday. He said, oh, I'm nearly home. I said, oh, mate, I think you might need to turn around and come back. And he's like, oh what's up? And then I just burst out crying and just said, look, mate, this, it, I'm in a bit of trouble. And then um, I got to the footy club, walked upstairs and, and the coaches knew I was coming back because they had their oppo um, meeting for the next game. And um, I remember walking in and Fags, Clarko, Jack Russell, who was our fitness coach, um, a couple others were just in the room and I just lost it for probably 15 minutes. And then, you know, worked out a plan and whatnot and then still had to try and get home and tell Sarah, which is, you know, probably the hardest as well. So mm-hmm. for, you know, thinking you're going to get back and play within a couple of weeks to basically, you know, thinking you're going to be out for the next or your career could be done. It was a mm-hmm. um, fair, fair few emotions. Well, it's a lot to process in, Huge. in, you know, the blink of an eye. Yeah. Essentially. Like it's, it's quick news that hits fast and hard. Yeah. yeah. That's that's yeah. wild, mate. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's um yeah, I I don't even know what, like I you can, I can't put I can't put myself in your shoes in that situation, you know. Like if some of the stories I've I've heard mm-hmm. from from guests have been about, you know, like whether we've someone's had anxiety or depression or yeah. you know, something and, and I've been able to sort of internally find similarities in in, in you know some of my experiences but that's just a you know world apart from anything i have let alone like you said being in that in the professional athlete mode of going you know one i'm dealing with 
you know, four tumors on the line, but two, this is mm. potentially the end of my career. You know, like my livelihood is also going to be thrown out the window. Yeah. You know, like there's, there's so much going on in, mm. in there. And, but that, that's, that, and that's, the hard thing is that's the selfish mindset of athletes. Like you worry, you straight away go and worry about yourself. And that's, I think that's just what makes, maybe what makes athletes so good is that they're so driven mm. internally, but you still then have to understand the impact that it had on close friends, family, mm. but also how protective you were too. Like I didn't, Sarah didn't come once to the hospital. I just was so protective and said, look, you're not coming to see me, whether it be at your worst or, um, you know, I had Geordie came to one and I had another mate come to, to treatments and whatnot. And then towards the end, I was, because, because it was, I suppose, a little bit high profile is that I was able to do a lot of my treatment just in, in private rooms and stuff like that because mm. and not because i wanted to do that but i guess you know you're 29 years old you're the poster boy for melanoma um you're mm. poster boy for a clinical trial that's going on at the time you don't really want to be signing up for that so no, 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 no. well like it's enough to deal with on its own without yeah. you know like from you know back pages of, pa of papers you know giving them giving the whole fucking world updates on like how it's going and stuff and yeah yeah, and it is, and even just like, I know, like, so Lucy, my partner's a, um, she's a nurse, and she used to work at Epworth uh, in Richmond, and so she would see it all the time and see the frustration, you know, in like the AFL players and stuff coming in because it's obviously the closest hospital to the G, so they'd so often be in there for you know for injuries and stuff, and it they really saw like the frustration of like this extra added thing of like, oh, they've got to shut down wards mm. so people aren't coming in and, you know, like reporters calling the, you know, calling the nurses station, pretending to be family to try and get updates yeah. on X, Y, Z player and stuff like that. It's, you know, it's yeah. enough. I, I, I get why people are interested and people are obviously invested, right? So like there's part of that, that, you know, a lot of, you know, imagine how many Hawks, you know, supporters and just AFL supporters in general would have been, you know, thinking about you and, and, and concern for your well-being and stuff. But, uh, you know, to like, for it to be, you know, news stories as opposed to just, yeah, like that's that's just an element that I can only imagine. And, and don't get me wrong, everyone's intentions were, were always good and you're getting support. But when you play a team sport and, and when you're a leader of a team sport and you go from basically putting yourself as player 48 because you've got to put all the players ahead of you to then separate yourself from that but still have your toe in the water to basically focus on yourself and be selfish mm. and just focus on your health which people can understand is still one of the hardest things um to go through and then again you got to flip it back 180 because then 12 months later i get announced as captain so mm. you know shit shit that's just um it's it's the a weird mindset of what had to happen in 18 months and yeah. you know there was time i, I remember there was times um when you're at your lowest, like I would have, because I was on a clinical trial, I was basically a guinea pig for what this was doing at the time. It was, um, you know, there was only two people in Peter Mac that were on it because it was still a clinical trial. It wasn't subs it wasn't subsidised by the the government. So unfortunately, you know, I was like, well, I was very lucky that there was a couple of supporters within Hawthorne, um, as well as the club and myself that came to an agreement because each treatment at the time was thirty six thousand dollars a treatment. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't physically make the drug until they saw me in the building. So I'd ring and say, look, I'm on my way. They'd say, yeah, no worries. And they, you know, it was basically the placebo effect. Yep, we'll make Jared feel good saying we've started now, but until he gets in the building, we're not going to start making this drug because of, you know, if he has a crash and can't come or something. Yeah, like that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, now it's, I, I think it's $18. Yeah, uh, and there's, you know, and Peter Max full which means it's working and it's doing its job. So um, you go from that to then at the time, you know, that you, and I was very open with my nurse and oncologist saying that this was the, um, these were the side effects. This is what I'm going through. This is what's happening. And, you know, they were able to document it. And for a while there, you know, I wasn't allowed to go out with my friends because I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to have any beers and I wasn't allowed to train. So basically the three the releases that you've grown up with, mm. Um, from basically when you're 18 mm. to then at 29 getting told you cannot do all of them, that's when you're at your worst. So I remember talking to, um, you know, I, I saw a counsellor a couple of times and, and talking to her and mentioning this. It's like, 
oh, she's like, you, you, you know, you're answering your own questions yourself. It's like, this is not normal. Mm. And she's like, yeah, I understand. I was like, so what can we do? And she's like, I don't know. I was like, yeah, cool. So yeah. Basically, <laughs> the way not that, that you're looking for an answer for her, but yeah. um, I already knew the answers, but I just couldn't, you couldn't do anything about them. So you're just in, you're in basically neutral for 10 weeks. And that's the battle of mental health in so many different yeah. aspects is like, yeah. you know, like the answer is obvious. Like in so many cases, I know like, you know, Murph and I are very open about like our experiences with therapy and stuff. And I've been, you know, in it consistently for quite a few years now. And the amount of times that you walk in or walk out of a session and it's like, you know, they li- they're literally sometimes just like a fucking parrot. Yeah. Or a mirror to exactly what you're feeling, what you're saying. And I'm like, what did I pay this guy for again? But yeah. no, but like, but, but I ultimately, you know, the goal of it, like, well, I guess what I take from it is like an objective point of view and an objective, like not answer because you're right. They don't answer those questions, but it's no. like, they can just give an objective perspective on it. And yeah. And like, if you can take from that, then hundred percent, like that's exactly, mm. that's, that's kind of, yeah. When it, when it starts to work for you. What's with, um, I mean, that's, that's, you make such a good point about all of those support networks in that way, mm. like being gone or like all of the things that you have, you know, that have been successful for you to like balance, you know, that work yeah. and life or career and life and all that sort of stuff, uh, not being available to you anymore. Um, with the, like, with the decision to sort of compartmentalize like the family life and the treatment sort of stuff. Now, obviously I'm going to like dive into it too far and overstep the bounds or anything like that but it is yeah like that's like that strikes me as like quite a a difficult decision to make and I'm just curious you know without you know pulling back the curtain too far or anything like how how did you sort of approach that with I guess with your wife in particular yeah Yeah, well so I mentioned before that we were going through a reno at the time so that keep that kept her busy yeah okay also too like she, she had just started a new job at Swiss and she was you know, getting her career off to um, flying colours. So, but also too, at the time, Sarah's is only twenty six. Yeah. So, yeah. if if shit went south, you didn't. I didn't want her to see or remember you at your worst. Yeah. And not that I ever ever thought like that, because you know, at the day two after I told had told Sarah, I came home and she was nowhere because she basically looked at Google for two hours, and that has you in the ground. So. Yeah. You know, I think that's just your 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 parental instincts or you just your mm-hmm. care. It's just like, well, also I mentioned before with dad and stuff like that, being the eldest, you, you kind of just got to protect um, those who mean the most mm-hmm. to you. So I, I didn't want them to see me um, at your worst. And and I was very open and honest with doctors and nurses, as I said, and which which I think got me through a lot of it because they knew what to do at what time. So yeah. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, and and the boys were very good in understanding that they'd go to Geordie or they'd go to, um, you know, basically the, the, the close ones that I knew. So you didn't have to answer the question 50 times a day, how you're feeling or what you're doing. So yeah, yeah. they were very good and very respectful in that way. And I think, you know, mentioning before that going to the club was, was your safe place and your second home. Um, I just think that's what, what you've learned as an athlete over time. Yeah. I'm interested... On that as well, you sort of, I mean, continuing on the question in, in the fact that, you, you know, you said that the three releases had had gone. What yeah. you mentioned as well, that you spoke to a, a counsellor a couple of times too, but I'm, I'd love to know at what point in, in that experience did you discover a new release or, you know, something that helped you? Mm-hmm. And, and if you did, other than speaking to the counsellor, what... You know, would, would you share, is there, you know, any strategies that you had, you know, when you were feeling knocked around from from your treatment and, you know, needed to find the pep in your step again, what you went to? I think one thing that I found helpful and I've still got it um, is, is the, I did a daily journal based on how you felt. So from the start of the first treatment that I had, it was actually Geordie's wife who gave me the book. She, said, she or gave me the journal. She said, I just reckon document what you're going to go through. So having that every night and some, some of the days you're looking at the writing because you know how you were feeling at that time and whatnot. It's like, yeah. uh, you know how bad you were here. So I, I've still got it in the bottom drawer in, in my room, but I think that helped a fair bit, just being able to say, right, oh, this is... And also different changes because it got to a stage, like I was supposed to have four treatments and I only had three because 
um, your body is basically full of drug of the drug. So it started to turn on yourself. So I had to have other drugs to try and um, counteract what I was going through. And um, I was off, I was off the testing, you know, as a, as an, as an athlete. So what they had to do to balance me back was give me some steroids that, um, you know, I was having stupid amounts of milligrams and probably it took, I'm going to say three months to wean myself off them just because wow, yeah. but, uh, two days after having them, I felt like I was back. I felt like I could run. Wow. Um, whereas yeah. a couple of days before you're walking Waverly in shorts and a singlet in the rain and people are like, what are you doing? And that was, that was my only way to feel alive is having the cold wind in your face. Yeah. Was like, and people are like, you're a dickhead, but <laughs> yeah, it was like, that was the only way I could feel like I felt alive. Yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. And so that, so is that just, that came as like an effect of the drugs, is it? So I guess it's just not. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So yeah. basically what happened was it just, as I said, it started to turn on my body. So the, the different, I had inflamed eyes, liver failure, not liver failure, but liver issues. Um, my lungs were inflamed. And then the final one, which I've spoken about is, is my feet. Um, the nerves in my feet started to get eaten away. So I'd have bad pins and needles or tingling frostbite type feelings. And yeah, I kind of said to the doc, look, if I'm ever going to get back to my job, I need my feet to be feeling all right. So mm -hmm. that was when they kind of put a full stop to the, to the treatment. And I'd had follow-up scans that were, were pretty positive. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when they start doing other, other types of, um, I went through, you know, four or five different other drugs to try and, flip the script on this nerve i had nerve conduction tests i was i was you know for someone like the story to for people to understand it's like right i've got to go to peter mac this day i've got to go to malvern that day to go to you know see neuro neuro neurologists and stuff like that it was just like yeah pretty full on never ending just constant nah. and and when you're like you know i've had a family member go through some pretty brutal cancer and, you know, when you, you beat up like that as well, and you know that you've got to go to, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for yeah. appointments. There's, I know I've, I've seen it in him and he, he didn't have the energy and it's, you know, you're feeling like shit because of the treatment, but then you have to find a way to get yourself to the next appointment. Yeah. That's pretty full on. It's pretty scary stuff. Mm. Yeah. Unbelievable. What, what, I mean, you mentioned just as well before the, the treatment that you took is now readily available and, you know, like 18 bucks a pop or something. Is there, is there sort of like a, I don't know how to word this. Like, is there like a, but it's all, I mean, you've got to like being like part of, yeah, being part of the like being early trial. trial. Oh, yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like um, I, I was lucky enough. Um, and it was just random that I was at Peter Mac that day, but I met the guy that, that founded or basically, you know, invented it up in a lab. Um, yeah. Yeah. He was a guy from Texas. He was actually winning a Nobel prize for, for doing it. Holy shit. And it was just like, you know, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't just pick him if he was in your bowl of cereal in the morning. It was just like, mm -hmm. wow, this bloke has just mm -hmm. saved so many lives without knowing. So, you know, you basically give him a big hug and say thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. What was that like? But the the amount of, I suppose now because because it was so open and and not just because of the drug, but the amount of people that got skin checks and, I mean, the, the percentages of people that got skin checks post my diagnosis it was like right, if something good comes of this, it's going to be that other people are going to be found earlier than maybe what I was and don't have to go through something like this. So I guess, yeah, you feel like you've been able to help people in a, in a way, but at the same time, it's not something you wish you had to go through. No, no of course not. Sure. Absolutely. Is any of that sort of stuff been ongoing? Like, are you still, are you still like, like, you know, affiliated with Peter Mac and doing any of that sort of stuff? Like yeah, that? I mean, anything that they ask, I'll basically do. Um, you know, now, that, like Donna, who was my nurse and Grant, who's my oncologist, they're more than just, doctor patient or nurse patient like they both came to my first game of footy um grant's daughter did work work experience at the hawks um so did donna's son so at the, the amount of the just the connection you have now and the friendship yeah. you have with these guys it's special. um yeah it's more than just patient doctor it's just like right these guys are genuine friends yeah yeah that's no, pretty yeah. special i think it's kind of inevitable when you when you're sharing that raw experience and they're, yeah. they're seeing you that you know like you, you mentioned the the positions that you don't want your family to see you at it's yeah you kind of hope that that's the relationship you can form and i know that they'd probably feel the same sentiment towards you as well in, in that 
being able to go through that with you and and call you a mate as well so mm. it's pretty cool to yeah to hear that side of the coin um i think um from from here and i guess sort of lead, leading on from that and uh, and this is a portion of the conversation that liam and i are particularly excited for being both tragic sainters oh, yeah. the, uh, um, with i mean with all of these experiences i guess i like i'm always curious about you know for for players that are like transition into administration roles into coaching roles like you have at the saints and especially for yourself with this like unbelievable trajectory of experience like at you know the pinnacle mm. and you know part mm. of one of the great teams and and a, an amazing you know career player for for yourself and then obviously you know all of this personal experience that was incredibly public as well did was we did that kind of did that experience give you a bit of confidence going into that sort of administration leadership role off the field as well is that sort of where you had always hoped to go post footy I guess if you had even thought about it um you know before you know all of your trials and tribulations with your health um, yeah I, I definitely wanted to go like the list management side of things is what um I'm passionate about I guess just through fascination with NBA basketball really and seeing what free agency and, and drafts and um, trade periods and whatnot are like um, I feel that as if coaching you could always come back to if you needed to. Yeah. I'm not saying at AFL level it could be at any level, but while I'm only 35, I might as well give this one a crack, crack mm. first. So, um, I, I, yes and no. I mean, you walk into a footy club that's got one flag, um, of course you're going to feel a little bit of... Um, um, you're going to feel good about yourself knowing that you can make a difference because you've seen and you've lived what it takes to win one. But at the same time, what we did at Hawthorne isn't going to work at, at St Kilda. So I've got to be very careful in what I say and what I do because I don't want to implement all the things we did at Hawthorne to say, right, it's just going to work for you guys. They're a totally different group to what we are. But if I can, if I can open up their eyes to see the game rather than just seeing it from their point of view, um, you know, it's almost like you're referring it to a horse where it's like blinkers off first time. And if you see that and you see them start to play for each other and, and play as a team, I think you'll start to see what they really can do. Now, this is not just an on-field thing. I think it's an off-field thing too because they've been starved of team success. Mm. Unfortunately for the Saints, they've had to pump up their individuals so much, which I think has... Um, one, not not caused, I suppose, um, selfishness, but I think, it, it, you know, we'd rather celebrate the individual more than we'd rather celebrate the team, which, I, I, you know, growing up, and, and, and until you've been through it and experienced it, it's the hardest thing to try and teach players at a footy club, I think. So um, it's a working progress. I think that we're starting to, um, starting to see the benefit now of, of what we can do as a whole club, not just a, a, a men's side anyway, but um, it wasn't going to be a trajectory that just went like, went like this in three years' time. Um, but I am enjoying it. It's something that it's like, right, if you, and also too, if I can win here, far out, I reckon it might open doors anywhere. Yeah, yeah, you're, not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely not wrong. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'd all we'd be grateful, wouldn't we, man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be coming to give you a big hug and kiss. Oh, so good. Um, I, oh, sorry, you go. So I just wanted to you one thing that stood out to me is you know that the, the concept of playing for a team, not an individual. Mm. And I think as you know, we're unashamed, unashamed to be big St. Kilda tragics, and we've seen, you know, like individual success Robert Harvey you know Jack Steele at the moment Nick Raywell you know, Lenny Hayes these absolute superstar individual footballers Brendan Goddard mm. um and you know always been missing that that team success and when you were saying that it's sort of in my head it's sort of like I was just ticking away at the fact that you know like I guess like the way I see it to get to the stage of playing professional football you have to be noticed as a junior right so yeah playing your junior footy in your, in your team to win the best and fairest, to, to start to get attention from scouts and whatever. And then you, you, you're trying to get attention to play in the state system. And then when you're playing at, you know, mm. underage tournaments, you're, you're trying to get attention to be drafted. And, and you know, so you, you, you are sort of playing for me 
throughout your whole junior career. And, um, you know, like, I mean, you'll probably... I know, you may. In, in, yeah. I think, but I also think too, like, I've never won a best and fairest in my whole career and I've never... Yeah. I've only won premierships at AFL level. So I've I was yeah. never been able to say, you know, like, I was always jealous of... Like I didn't get picked for an under sixteen grand final, and one of my groomsmen did, and he was he was no good. He didn't spend any time on the ground, but he'll hold that on. I got own. yeah, that's that's what shits me the most because they, yeah. they have like two thousand. So last year there was a twenty year in for an under sixteen flag, and and I don't get invited, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. but it reminds you of how like I wanted to be a part of it, and I was only yeah, thirteen. Yeah, I'm only thirteen. I was only thirteen in under sixteen flag. So, but that that like reunions and, and catch-ups now and team success is what you're going to be remembered for like i look at yeah for sure hawthorne the hawthorne stuff when you go through to um 25 year reunions and you're sitting sitting down afterwards at midnight with dunstall Brerett and dipper Bacanara, um john kenny and these guys are just telling stories and it's like i'm a little kid again or yeah, yeah. benny robbins or and these guys telling you about the Brisbane era and stuff like that. It's like, this yeah. is the, this is what footy was like, or this is what you wanted to be yeah. a kid for. So, and now I think too, with the, the junior program is we make kids so professional from 15 oh, yeah. years old that unfortunately you don't get to see them grow up. You don't get to see them be risk takers and you don't get to see yeah. them be themselves. So yeah, it's something I think we've got to try and fix it because you know, it's the same when you see them in interviews and whatnot. They're just robots that just give yeah. flat answers every time and you don't get to see the personality of each kid, which I yeah. think is a shame. Yeah, no, big time. I mean, Tommy, first chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tommy yeah. Nichols, one of our good mates from way back. Yeah. yeah. He, he was our, you know, God love him. He was the first person to jump on board with us and, mm. and throw his support behind us. And he said exactly that. He said, you know, my whole aim every time I had an interview was to take the piss out of the interview because yeah. we were trained to be robots and give these specific answers. And he's like, you know, I hated that and that's not me. And so mm. he would always throw a spanner in the interview and, <laughs> you know, tell a lie or whatever, just to keep everyone on their toes. And who else, someone else told us they could- oh, oh, it was frosty as well, wasn't it? Um, oh, sorry, Illy, remember he was like, oh, in an interview, <laughs> yeah. Illy, the, the musician was like- yeah. You know, Oh yeah, yeah. In, in a similar vein, I need to, you know, give these really professional answers and he was just getting sick of being asked these questions. So he told a journalist. That the, the, hard, the hard thing, the hard thing with all this too is you're bound by sponsors and you're bound right. by right. teams. So that's that's the hardest thing. So when you're getting yeah. guys on, you know, when they're, when, they're, when they're guards down and when you can just not have to worry about, you know, kicks, handballs, wins, losses and yeah. money, money on the books, it's like, right, that's when you get the genuine answers from sure. yeah. athletes. Have a good chat, yeah. With so with that, I guess as being like part of your broader goal, I guess with with being at the Saints of like mm. you know shifting that sort of self focused mindset a little bit and like you know opening up for that you know group team success, and it's obviously a hard thing. It's obviously not a super simple answer, but what are like maybe broadly like what do you think are the things that foster that you know like broader sense of uh, success you know in people and like people looking outside of themselves, and I guess it's probably applies to a lot of life as well, because yeah. I think life is better served when you're, you know, in service of others and not, you know, only yeah. in service of yourself, but like, what are some things that more broadly you think maybe that you recognize from your previous experience with the Hawks or, you know, even just in life in general? Um, oh, in life now, it's definitely perspective for what I've been through. Um, only, only, only because now you're a dad and stuff like that. So but individually it'd be that but at, for for us as a team i think we were very very lucky that we had um a group of um, a leadership group especially that were perfect like we had gibson in the back line me in the forward line mitchell hodge and lewis in the midfield and that was our leadership group for five years in a row mm. so we, we grew together we challenged each other and what we did was able to filter down through the rest of the playing group so mm. At times in games when um, you know it got to that, that time, those times where it was like, right, we need something amazing to happen. It was like, no, nah, just go back to basics, do the simple things well, and that's what will hold us in good stead. And also, we as a leadership group would make decisions on field without the coach's box having to come out. So yeah. they 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 trusted us and they they gave us the power to make decisions on the field, whether it be right or wrong. But I think 
you know, we had such a good coaching group that also we had five assistant coaches on field or six yeah. assistant coaches on yeah. field. So yeah, okay. we had so many strong leaders that, you know, were just right place, right time, really. Like yeah. from CEO down to boot stutter, um, yeah. we had just the perfect team. That's the like, and I guess that applies, yeah, again, like so much broadly, so very broadly beyond sport as well, is that like the top down is the way that like, that's like how you get success mm. and understanding, mm. I guess, like across. No, I, 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 would, I wouldn't say just top down. I'd say like the good people, like we were very, very lucky. Like Stuart Fox was CEO, Mark, uh, Andrew Newbolt, president, Fagan GM, Clarko coach, Hodgie captain, Jack Russell fitness, like all these guys now, have moved on to big and better things because they've all sacrificed. And this is what one thing Clarko said to us early days was that if you sacrifice coin now, I guarantee you'll make it all back, back end footy mm. career. Mm. So we all took, we all probably took less to all stay together, mm. hoping, and, and this is a hard thing trying to tell players now too. If you all take less and sacrifice the, and again, if, if you win at St Kilda, you look at Melbourne, they had 1.2 yeah. million just, um, merchandise sales a day after the granny, which was yeah. two years worth of merchandise. It's like if you win and sacrifice and win together, you will be looked after forever. Yeah. So trying to, like you've lived it and trying to then apply this or pass on knowledge to this St Kilda team now, yeah. it's not easy, but you know, if the if the penny drops, you watch. Is, is that what, I guess, is that what's getting you out of bed each day? Is that that drive to, Oh, to want to win, yeah. Like I mean, uh, you want to, yeah, you want to see, and I think we've seen it in small ways the improvement within the 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 footy club, and they're starting to have a a big footprint in the AFL now with their members and Mm -hmm. the Danny Froy Centre and and what Morabin is now, Um, and you know, being there for the last three years and and meeting St Kilda fans, they're just impatient, and you can understand why. We've seen the Bulldogs, we've seen Sydney, we've seen Richmond, we've seen Melbourne, we've seen all yeah. these teams that have won flags that have been through premiership droughts. And unfortunately, you know, we might not be saying that there would be a drought if Milne grabbed the ball and kicked it through in 2010. But yeah, there's a few. There's or there's a, few. a, you know, like it's not as if we haven't been in grand finals and given ourselves a chance. Yeah. It's just like, you know, if we can, you watch because they'll be a powerhouse with all the members that will jump on board if they win. Well, that, that I mean, even the membership thing, and this is getting into real specific footy talk, but I saw something the other day that, like, the Saints had, like, the fifth highest membership tally so far yeah. in the league. And, you know, like, for a team that's got had no success... Yeah. To, I reckon they're about, to go, they're about to go over 50,000 in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, wild. Like, yes. that's for, you know, that that's loyalty, the strength in numbers, you know, it's... Mm. It's what hopefully gets some inspiration behind the boys. But anyway, so round one, I'd like to hope that you both use your membership passes and go to the Collingwood game. Well, I've already <laughs> in a few. I'm already. I'll, I, uh, I'll try and avoid the fence. Oh, here we owner. go. Here they come. Proud owner of a supporter <laughs> membership, actually. And you know what? Ironically, uh, this is the universe making me fucking pay for not being a member uh earlier is me or like a you know a handful of the boys we on like on New Year's Eve. Had a few frosties. Yeah. And committed. All right. This is a blood oath packed commitment. We're all getting fucking St. Kilda memberships finally. 2020, obviously. Oh, yeah. So you've got one and haven't been able to go to a game in two years. And then 2021, <laughs> we re upped. We donated the membership, re up. Yeah, fuck it. This is the year, boys. COVID's done. Fuck it. We'll, we'll get to all the games. It's going to be great. <laughs> so 2022, I'm like, all right, here we go. Re up, re up, re up. And then round one is about, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you'll be having a baby. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly 30 days before I'm going to be a fucking dad for the first time. 2022 is our year then. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, it. 100%. Yeah. yeah, we're on. I think so. No, nah, no, but yes, no, I'm very excited for it to all kick back off. And yeah, and it's, it is really interesting. And I think like it's nice to like understand the mindset a little bit better, I guess, you know, as like within within the club and, and even just more broadly, like, because I can't imagine what even within all these clubs, like within the AFL in general, like what the last couple of years has been like for so many reasons, like plans just being flipped upside down and players having to learn to adapt to all sorts of circumstances, you know, and coaching staff, mm. you know, field staff, you know, any operational sort of stuff. Like it's, yeah. 
I can just only imagine it's been so crazy. So I hope if, it, if we're heading in the direction of some version of normalcy, I think it'll be good for good for everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> time. Yeah, so Rafi, we'll, we'll continue on and start to round out the conversation, mate. And, and one thing we love to do um, is, is ask for, for your, I guess, dream conversation, who you'd love to sit down and have a chat with. Um, but we'd also love to, in a similar vein to Dyson Heppel, um, giving giving us your name to reach out and get in touch with you. We'd love to see if there's someone that you you would think would be a fantastic chat for us to to have as well. I mean, depending on if you is it, would you is it ideally sports people or is it what's the anyone what's the, open to any and any everyone? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I've got uh, there's enough different for you people. I think. Um, Johnny Hastings would be one I would recommend, who's um, a cricketer, who's a big Hawks man. He's from out Penrith way initially, but he he's obviously, um, his career came to an abrupt end due to uh, health issues as well. So he was, um, you know, he was going over the IPL. He was about yeah. to sign a deal with the Sydney Sixers. He played one test for Australia, which is pretty cool. And that, and I think he's got a wicket that's either Hashim Amla or AB De Villiers. Yeah, huge. Which yeah. is and which was Punner's last test in Perth. Oh wow! Which yeah. is crazy. A pretty cool story to hear afterwards. Going to Gilly's joint, or sorry, Gilly's mansion, and seeing. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> one of Gilly's mansions. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know now he's a he lives down in Frankston Way where he, he runs a cafe and also a Pilates studio. So he's one that I'd recommend, and it was also very very good for a yarn. Yeah. Well, that. Yeah. Was, oh, that's our neck of the woods. Yeah. yeah. Woods at the moment. We're not far. I from think he owns. I think he owns Mr. Frankie. Oh, okay. I know Mr. Frankie. Eh? Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it's in Frankston, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's oh, Johnny, Johnny and his wife, um, Bree. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's awesome. Nice. Well, Do you know what? We haven't actually spoken to a cricketer yet. No, I don't see it. Can... That might be a good start. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, so I, can, I, I can do the intro too, boys, if you need. So. Oh, that would be very appreciative. That'd be awesome, mate. Yeah. Um, in mirroring that, or the next part of that question, who who do you idolise? Who's the one person you'd love to sit down and have a have a chat with that maybe you haven't had the opportunity to so far? Um, oh, that's a good. I don't, you don't really get a chance to think like that. I mean, uh, big basketball nuts. So at least any one of the the you know top five or the, the I mean, if you watch the All Star game the other day, um, and you see those top seventy five players get recognised. Mm -hmm. Um, over the 75 years of the NBA. Hmm. I guess, you know, seeing the, the respect that Jordan still has, um, he'd definitely be one. Um, other sports people, I'm a big, like when they say, who do you follow in soccer? It's just always Latan Ibrahimovic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. got, I'm a big fan of him. Um, so probably, probably one of those two, just to, you know, just yeah. pick their brains and see what's made them so good for 40 years of their career. Yeah. Amazing. Do you know, I'd love to sit down with MJ, but I'd be scared shitless to talk to him. Yeah. He Mate, just, like, uh, and, and all us kids this age are going to say that. And everyone yeah. going on. And, yeah. You know, I, was, I, was, I, hope, I never got to see Jordan play. I never got to see Kobe play. And I've been lucky enough to see LeBron play a few times. But That's even, nice. as I said, when Jordan gets introduced the other day at All-Star Weekend, everyone just went bonkers. So, oh, yeah. But yeah. still at 60-odd, he's got the pull that he does. Yeah, unbelievable. And he's turned it into an absolute business and a half as well oh. like, he, his brain i'd love to pick that brain as well no. he's that bloke. yeah <laughs> yeah so i yeah. last thing for us ruffy i guess um and we sort of mentioned yeah mentioned mentioned the man martin heppel a minute ago um uh has you know when meta was first kicking off provided us with this incredible little activity of checking in with people and seeing if uh you know as something as as you know historically as blokes are not super great at you know telling our mates that we love them and yeah. um yeah so his little activity that he would always do you know get his get his mates on the phone and just give him a little 30 second you know uh blast of love from uh you know and then be on with the day and it was a beautiful yeah. little exercise and something that um yeah that, that that we that we love here at the men of words and i guess as a lead into that would be interested to know if uh, for yourself is that something that you is that something that exists inside your comfort zone you feel pretty comfortable telling your mates that you love them and then also if you want to would be happy to take this opportunity to give a little a uh, little shout out to someone that maybe yeah maybe deserves one yeah so i reckon it's it's something that i'd never heard of before and i remember speaking to murph initially when 
he said that this was going to be one thing that you do. It's like, well, I'm lucky. I'm not going to say lucky. I do it nearly at the end of most phone calls to the boys anyway. So, yeah. I'm, like, I've got two of my best mates from home live in Perth, and I haven't been able to see them for two years. Yeah. Um, the only time I saw them last year was behind a fence. Like, we had to, like, they came and visited when we had to isolate for a week, and we they rolled two beers under the fence because Perth's quarantine was fuck like we yeah. had cop, cops, <laughs> rock up, cops rock up to do a head count and they sat on one side of the fence and the security guard would watch just so we didn't have to touch so they'd roll the beer under the thing so those two you know they came to my last game of food back from perth um and in the mean like i've had will we've had will sorry he's had a boy another mate's had a boy and a girl and we haven't been able to meet yet so wow. little things and this is where i think facetime's been wonderful too because you're yeah. meeting you're meeting kids you're meeting um, you're just keeping in contact. So those guys, you'd ring once a week and and always you finish the conversation with love you. And and I did it this, like this morning with Dewey. Rang Dewey for half an hour. He was on his way down to Melbourne um, for the AFL launch. And same thing, just at the end of the conversation, it's like, love you. And it's like, yeah, like the, the friendships that footy has given me for all, and this is all around Australia, like Dewey at 6.30 at in, in, the Gold Coast. Mm. I'm not going to ring the Perth boys at seven in the morning here because it's four over there, but... Yeah. When you can, same thing like Ben Stratton, he he left to go to the hub in Sydney when Hawthorne left at halfway through 20 and he hasn't been back to Victoria yet. And he's been married, he's had a kid and I, and he married um, Sarah's best friend. So shit like that, that it's just like, well, this last two year period, you just, I suppose you just don't, you just don't take anything for granted, especially yeah. for where we've lived. So that, that type of thing just comes natural to me, which I'm very, very lucky for. 100%. Right. And it's like you say, luck, but also like, I mean, that's a, it's a skill, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like that's a practice thing. And this one is we love so much about this little activity and it just, it, and it, it, it forces you to, to have that perspective. It forces you to take that, you know, you know, have that appreciation for those little things. And, and you're right. I mean, you circle the point perfectly with the like the last two years, if anything's given us a whole yeah. lot of perspective, it's been that for sure. So, and and I, I mean, I'd show emotion on the field. I'd give, you know, teammates a kiss on the forehead and stuff like that too. So it's not not something that you're ashamed of, that's for sure. No, no, no it doesn't need to be, that's for sure. Yeah. No, awesome, mate. That's great to hear. And yeah, thanks for for sharing that. And hopefully, hopefully you can find some time to get over to Perth and and cross paths with your mates. And, They're round two. So um, yeah, hey, there we go. They'll be all right. They I um I think Funnily enough, the weekend after that, there's a wedding back on back home that one of them will be coming to. So it'll be, it'll be a plethora of just catch ups, which means we might be fucking pissed for about a week, I reckon. <laughs> long overture. Yeah, long yeah. overture. That's man. sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, awesome, mate. I've, I've, uh, yeah. Nice place to finish, I think. And really want to express our, our thanks and gratitude for, yeah, for, for, I guess, being willing to work with us and, and, and finally get to a, mm. a point where we can sit down and have this, this chat. And it's a shame we, yeah, we couldn't do it in, in person and um, probably definitely owe it to you to, to cross paths in person and, and chat your beers as thanks, mate. It's been we'll roll a couple time. of beers under the fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no, well, thank you boys too for being so patient. I know it's been, as you said, April last year, so it hasn't been easy, but what you guys are doing too is unreal. So well done. Um, all the best. For the baby impending in the next month yeah thanks very much man. Um, both look forward to wedding plans always remember to thank her on wedding night yeah i think i'm gonna have to get <laughs> that the last thing the last head. thing you have to do and then uh yeah i look forward to this beer one day 100 really rough rough. No, you're an absolute star mate we yeah really excited and, and yeah thanks again for your time mate muff it's always a pleasure yes, to, to sit down magic. with you mate and I will pass this on because I know like we caught up just a little bit earlier before, but I know you've had a bit of a stressful time with impending fatherhood and, yeah, and getting right. everything ready. But um, as you know, the doors always open. <laughs> I love you, mate. So No, I appreciate it, Murph. Oh, look, nothing a good men of words conversation can't fix up. So I appreciate you both for that one very much. For everybody listening, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and hope you've enjoyed our chat with Jared Ruffhead. This is the Men of Words podcast where the little conversations make the biggest differences.